Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to all of you joining us from all parts of Australia for this online and in-person event. Uh, I would particularly like to welcome those of you joining us in person from the Northern Territory. My name is Mary Kvai and I'm the President of the Victorian Branch of the Economic Society and one of the organisers of today's event. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Economic Society acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I am very pleased to open this event on behalf of the Economic Society of Australia, the Women in Economics Network and the Charles Darwin University to showcase recent Australian economic research on issues affecting the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The role of the Economic Society is to encourage the study of economics and to promote discussion and debate of economic issues within Australia. For economics to remain relevant and attractive to future graduates, it must focus on matters that affect the well-being of our First Nations people. We also need to work with our First Nations people, draw on the perspectives, priorities and knowledges of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people if well-being is to be improved. And this concords with the goal of reconciliation. For reconciliation to be effective, it must involve truth-telling and actively address issues that impact our First Nations people, issues like inequality, underrepresentation, systemic racism and intergenerational trauma. And part of our role in this reconciliation journey is to build a network of supporters, which events like this can do, and I hope it's the first of many. And uh, now to introduce our speakers today and just discuss some housekeeping briefly. We will first hear from Dr. Manika Jayasinghe. Manika is a senior lecturer in economics at the Asia Pacific College of Business and Law at Charles Darwin University. Uh, Manika is a co-host of today's event and she did an ama amazing amount of work and outreach in setting up the Darwin side of the event. Uh, she will first talk about growing um, the economics community in the NT and then she will present for 15 minutes on the financial resilience and life satisfaction nexus of Indigenous Australians, which was published in the Society's Economic Papers. After Manika, we will hear from Professor Guillaume Carb, who is a professorial fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research at the University of Melbourne. Guillaume will present for 15 minutes on childcare use and its role in Indigenous child development, based on a paper in the Society's Economic Record and the ESA Best Paper of 2019. Um, there will be time for Q&A on those two papers, facilitated by Leonora Rees. And then we will hear from Renee Long. Uh, Renee is an Aboriginal Territorian who has had an extensive career in the public se sector in both state and federal governments. Renee was also the inaugural Chief Executive Officer for the Northern Territory Indigenous Business Network. Over her career, Renee has developed strong knowledge of Aboriginal economic development and employment programs. And Renee will present on achieving Indigenous economic participation by intervening around contracting conditions. And there will also be time for Q&A after Renee's presentation. And finally, Leonora Reese will close the event and we should finish by 12.30 p.m. Eastern time or 12 noon Darwin time. Uh, we welcome participation in this event. Uh, there is a Q&A function in Zoom where you can post your questions for the presenters. You can also comment and upvote questions you like. And finally, I'll just like to note that today's event will be recorded. And now I will pass on to Monika in Darwin. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mary, and um, good morning, everybody. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of the lands on which we are meeting today. And I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to all indigenous peoples. So uh, this event we are having today is very special for two reasons. 
Firstly, as uh, Mary mentioned, this event gives us the much needed opportunity to discuss about matters concerning to the well-being of Indigenous Australians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so firstly, as Mary mentioned, this event uh, gives us the much needed opportunity to discuss about matters concerning to the well-being of Indigenous Australians. And secondly, this event represents the very first official involvement of the Northern Territory with the Women in Economics Network Australia. The discussion on establishing the NT branch of WEN have been going around for about two years now. And as the Northern Territory WEN representative, I'm very happy that today we officially start WEN activities in the territory. And uh, I hope this will be just the first one of many more WEN activities to taking place in the territory. And this wouldn't have been possible if not for the generous support from the WEN National Chair, Dr. Leonora Ares, Mary Ann D from ESS Central, and the WEN committee members of other states and territories. I must also thank uh, Professor Gion Karp from the Melbourne Institute and Renny Long from the Northern Institute at Charles Darwin University for joining with us today and sharing your insights. Um, last but not least, I appreciate all the support received from the Asia Pacific College of Business and Law at Charles Darwin University to host the face-to-face -face component of today's event, especially the College Dean, Professor David Law, Assistant Dean Research, Professor Stephen Greenland, and Associate Professor Pascal Tremblay from the Northern Institute, and Dr. Bhanu Bhatia, Rupali Mishra, and Sarah Lambert, and others who have helped out in uh, their capacity. So uh, while this is the, the first when, uh, first NT when event, we are still at the infant stage. So we do not have an official committee yet. So I would like to take this opportunity to invite volunteers who are based in Darwin to uh, join with us. If you are interested, or if you know of someone who might be interested, please let us know. And with that uh, open invitation, I would like to move on to my presentation today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the financial resilience and life satisfaction nexus of Indigenous Australians. And this is a joint work with uh, professors E.S. Selvanathan and Saroja Selvanathan from uh, Griffith University. And the content of today's presentation is based on the, the paper published in Economic Papers Journal. Um, and this is the structure of the presentation. So um, there's a significant body of literature on the relationship between money and happiness, and the findings are mixed. While some research says that uh, money does help in bringing happiness to people, which suggesting a positive relationship. Some other research shows that there's a negative relationship between uh, money and happiness. So um, this inconsistent relationship between objective measure, measures of wealth, such as income and life satisfaction is not surprising because using the income, um, just the, an objective measure as the sole measure of financial wealth actually um, uh, provides an incomplete picture of the, the dynamics in the relationship between money and happiness. Therefore, uh, it is important to consider subjective measures of financial wealth in addition to objective measures uh, when we analyze the dynamics in the relationship between the money and happiness. So what are these ob subjective measurements? For example, the ability to manage money and cope with unexpected financial shocks, positive adaptation in times of financial adversities, avoiding excessing debts, having security buffers against emergencies and securing basic needs. So according to Rutter, 
the capacity to adapt positively and achieve good outcomes despite exposure to severe adversities can be considered as resilience. A considerable body of literature, particularly in psychology, health, and environmental studies note that resilience against the plethora of life events can be considered as a contributor to human well-being. As such, one can argue that one's financial resilience plays a significant role in enhancing life satisfaction. So uh, Muir and colleagues define financial resilience as the ability to access and draw on internal capabilities and appropriate acceptable and accessible external resources and support in times of financial adversity. Um, Saligneck and colleagues later then developed this financial resilience framework, which comprises of four components, economic resources, financial products and services, financial knowledge and behavior, and social capital. And as you can see, each individual component has its own subcomponents. For example, economic resources consist of savings, debts, income, et cetera. Um, so as I already discussed, this financial resilience consists of all these four components can have a significant uh, impact on one's life satisfaction. So in fact, actually during the COVID-19, I think many of us personally experienced most of so much, so many difficulties with respect to some of these aspects in the financial resilience framework. But let me explain why we specifically selected indigenous Australians in our study to look at this relationship between financial resilience and life satisfaction. So, it is because, uh, as most of you are already aware, Indigenous Australians face uh, challenges with respect to various aspects of this financial resilience at a much higher rate than non-Indigenous Australians do. For example, about 41% of non-Indigenous Australians reported earning equalized weekly household income of $1,000 or more in 2016, compared to only about 20% of Indigenous Australians. And about 72% of non-Indigenous Australians aged 15 and 64 years were employed compared to only about 47% of Indigenous Australians in the same age group. And those who were severely excluded from access to various financial services, 8.7% of non-Indigenous Australians had difficulties in opening a bank account compared with 17.9% of Indigenous Australians in the survey. Research also shows that lower level of literacy observed among Indigenous Australians and the list goes on. So despite these apparent differences, we observe that uh, there's a lack of research in this area, looking at the relationship between life satisfaction and uh, financial resilience. And therefore, in, we carried out this uh, study uh, with two objectives. The first one is to examine the link between components of financial resilience and overall life satisfaction of Indigenous Australians. And second is to examine the dynamics in the relationship between these two uh, concepts among various groups within Indigenous Australians, such as men and women, people in various age groups and income groups. So um, for this purpose, we use the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Survey data, commonly known as NAXIS, 2014-15 uh, survey conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The NAPSIS is a six yearly multidimensional social survey, and it provides broad self-reported information across key areas of social interest of Indigenous Australians. The most recent survey was conducted from September 2014 to June 2015 from a sample of 11,178 respondents 
covering um, all Australia. And uh, the, the data relating to the financial resilience uh, aspects we are talking about today is only collected from people over 15 and above. Therefore, we have a sample is confined to um, 7,018 respondents uh, whose age is above 50. So um, this survey is actually quite good in terms of the information it provides. So the table one summarizes the availability of uh, data with respect to the, the indicators um, in each component in the financial resilience framework. So um, um, data for the ability to meet living expenses, for example, was based on the question whether household members ran out of money for basic living in last 12 months. Uh, data for ability to raise funds in an emergency was based on the question whether household could raise $2,000 in an emergency and so on and so forth. So in general, the, the survey provide most of the cases survey provided exact data we wanted. However, survey also did not provide some of the data we needed. For example, survey didn't have data on savings or debts. And uh, I, it is important to note that the most of the data related to financial knowledge and behavior was not available in the survey, unfortunately. So uh, we have used the general level of education as a proxy variable for financial products and um, knowledge on financial products and services indicator. So um, I'm not going to spend too much about the methodology uh, here. It is there available in the published paper. So in short, uh, for the empirical analysis, we estimated an ordered logic model uh, taking the life satisfaction, self-perceived life satisfaction ranging from zero to 10. Uh, zero is the lowest and 10 is the highest as a dependent variable and the subcomponents of the financial resilience framework we looked at earlier uh, as the dependent, uh, independent variables. And in addition to that, uh, we also estimated het heterogeneity corrected models to investigate whether there are any gender, age, and income level related differences in the relationship between life satisfaction and financial resilience. So here I only present one uh, table with some basic results. Um, so uh, based on the estimated results, you can see that facing problems in accessing financial services and running out of money for living expenses decrease the overall life satisfaction. And having access to support in time of crisis, uh, ability to gather $2,000 in an emergency and frequent communication with family and friends increase the overall life satisfaction. In fact, running out of money for living, living expenses generates the highest negative impact on life satisfaction, followed by the ability to get support in times of crisis, which is a positive, and ability to gather $2,000 in an emergency, that's also positive. So I haven't reported the, the heterogeneity corrected model results here, but I'm just um, uh, taking you through the, the basic idea. So when we look at, the, look at whether there are any significant gender, age, or income differences in this relationship, and we didn't find any statistically significant difference. So what does this mean is that uh, the financial resilience related indicators affect um, life satisfaction of all indigenous Australians irrespective of gender, age and income level. So which means these factors are very common for everyone. Um, so in this concluding slide, I would like to highlight that there is a need for acknowledgement and directing policy and action towards the financial resilience aspects that Indigenous Australians consider important for enhanced life satisfaction of themselves. Uh, for example, while income itself doesn't have any significant uh, impact as we saw earlier, running out of money for living makes them unhappy. 
So this is related to really uh, income or, or financial management skills. So there is a need for support services and resources to facilitate them with financial and income management aspects. And then having access to money in an emergency make them happy, make everyone, everyone happy for that matter. So that means that more attention is needed to provide support services and flexibilities for Indigenous Australians to um, in accessing financial um, services and um, access to credits, for example. And I also think financial literacy uh, also plays a vital role in enabling Indigenous Australians to overcome some of these barriers and challenges. Unfortunately, that was not really apparent in our study because we didn't have uh, relevant data for that. So uh, that brings to the end of my presentation. And, uh, and I would like to hand over to Gion for her presentation now. Thank you. Okay, I think that should do it. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mary, Leonora and uh, Monica for organizing this uh, event today and for inviting me to it. Um, and before starting my presentation, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional, traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting um, today and pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging. And I would also like to extend my respect to uh, the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are attending uh, this event today. Okay, so getting into the uh, presentation. Um, Mir already indicated that this uh, is based on research that has already been published in the economic record. Um, so before going into the analysis and results, I briefly talk about the aim of the study and uh, some background information. Um, so our aim was to study patterns of childcare use in Indigenous communities and understand the influence of childcare on the cognitive development of indigenous children during their first five years of life. Um, to achieve this, we um, used data from the longitudinal study of indigenous children, which is a very rich data set that tracks a cohort of indigenous children from birth uh, and had its first wave in 2008. There is also a cohort um, that starts with children uh, aged four to five, um, but we are not using that in our study. Um, from this data, um, we use multiple measures of cognitive ability to assess the uh, influence of childcare use um, on a range of uh, cognitive measures um, measured at different st stages of their childhood. Um, a little bit of background. So when we started this paper, um, we already knew that childcare matters. That's been uh, shown in many uh, other papers. Um, so a positive impact on cognitive outcomes has been shown uh, many times, but this is usually based on non-Indigenous populations. And that was due to the fact that there is a lack of suitable data. There was a lack of suitable data for Indigenous populations as uh, general, general population surveys do not uh, collect the information for a sufficient number of indigenous families to carry out a separate analysis. Um, so the LSEC sort of uh, changed that and made this possible. Um, there were though some previous relevant results for indigenous children. So for example, in 2007, Nicholas Biddle showed that indigenous children are less likely to attend preschool activities than uh, children in the general population. Um, in 2009, uh, Andrew Lee and Xiao Dong Gong uh, showed that there is a large gap in cognitive scores between indigenous and non-indigenous children at the, st at the start of school. Um, and they found that um, indigenous children scored um, equivalent to non-Indigenous children at age four while they were age five. So that means that they start school um, with this one year lag in a way, and it's really difficult to catch up uh, on that. And so the closing the gap agenda of the government aims to change this. So they made, uh, proposed to make large investments to support the provision of childcare in remote and Indigenous communities. Um, but we don't actually know whether that will make a difference and whether that will work because we don't really know much about the impact of childcare uh, on outcomes for Indigenous children. 
Um, so in this study, um, we want to use the ELSIC data, as mentioned before, focusing on the baby co cohort, um, so that we can look at the early years and at school readiness uh, at age five. So what we did with the data was to apply very extensive data cleaning and also um, excluding any children outside the target age groups for any specific wave from the sample of analysis. And this was needed because the data was uh, a little bit more uh, messy than, for example, the longitudinal study of Australian children in the sense that um, there were a reasonable proportion of children that were quite far outside of the target age groups including those children in the analysis would sort of bias the results because you really need to compare children uh, of about the same age with each other rather than uh, have large age differences. We also aim to allow for selection into childcare as much as feasible with the data. And we show that this is really important. So we looked at the raw data uh, first and sort of looked at the key variables. So childcare use, we distinguish formal childcare which includes daycare centers, family daycare, and other formal childcare, like for example, nannies, of which there were uh, very few, um, and informal care, which includes care by relatives, friends, and neighbors. And when we look at the uh, data in the table on this slide, we see that there is uh, a lot of variation across uh, age for children um, in the formal care. We also see that um, there is a large difference in the proportion of children who ever used formal care and the proportion of children who ever used informal care, with the proportion in formal care being much lower than uh, ever using informal care. And so, as I mentioned before, the data we used was the first five waves of the ELSIC data, the baby cohort, which covers the first five years of a child's life. Um, the data was collected from 11 areas around Australia. And although this is not nationally representative, uh, it does resemble the distribution of indigenous children in 2008. So it does provide valuable information, but we cannot generalize our results to the national level. When we look at who is using uh, childcare, we find large differences. Um, so when we look at the um, probability of ever having used childcare at each of the different waves, we find that children from more advantaged families are more likely to attend. Um, so for example, children whose main carer has a university degree or is employed are much more likely to attend. Children who are read to um, or who lived in a family where there, was, where there were more than 11 children's books were more likely to attend. Children with unpartnered parents were also more likely to attend, but children with more siblings less likely. And so it's clear that um, the childcare use is not randomly distributed across um, families in the uh, survey. So we included lots of uh, explanatory variables um, so that we could control for birth and early childhood conditions, child characteristics, parent characteristics, the family and the home environment, uh, as well as indigenous culture and community characteristics and financial and life events that were experienced by the families at the time of the interview. Um, but it's sort of the ones that I mentioned above that showed um, significant uh, differences in terms of the proportion used in childcare. Before showing some, uh, some uh, summary statistics on the cognitive outcomes, I just want to briefly explain the four measures that we use. So we uh, have the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Index in wave three um, for children aged two and a half to three and a half years to assess uh, children's expressive vocabulary and their early grammar skills. And this is uh, a measure that's reported by the parents. In wave four and wave five, uh, covering children three and a half to four and a half years and four and a half to five and a half years, um, we have information on the Renfrew vocabulary test, which assesses children's ex expressive vocabulary by ex examining their capacity to name pictures of objects arranged in order of difficulty. Then we have a second uh, measure for wave five, 
um, the Who Am I measure, which is a developmental test of school readiness that looks at children's ability to write a name, write letters, and copy shapes. So when we look at the mean scores um, for these uh, four measures and look at it separately by children who ever used uh, formal childcare and children who never used formal childcare, uh, which are presented in the box with the red line around it, we can see um, that there are large differences between the two groups. Um, so children who were ever in formal childcare performing uh, much better than children who never were in formal childcare. And so the difference is uh, sub quite substantial. We can see this in the right-hand column and it's significant for all measures. However, we also know that uh, the use of childcare is not, or the use of formal childcare is not uh, randomly uh, distributed across children in the survey. So cell selection in formal childcare is clearly important and we need to uh, try and control for this to see whether there remains a direct impact from formal childcare, even if we allow for this selection. So we cannot do this in, in, in a perfect way. I think that's hardly ever possible, but we use two different approaches to try and control as much as possible with the data for this. So the first one is just to uh, estimate a regression with a very comprehensive set of controls to assess whether the uh, formal childcare coefficient remains significant and large. The second approach is a propensity score matching approach, which aims to create groups of similar children where the only difference between groups is whether they use or don't use childcare. So again, um, we, we, we have a very comprehensive set of covariates, which is a major advantage of the LSIC data. Um, so we have uh, several studied child characteristics. Um, we have a rich set of characteristics on the main care of the child. Um, we know a lot about the family environment. We know about their household composition, but also um, the housing that they live in uh, and the family activities that take place. Uh, finally, we also have a number of uh, variables that uh, describe um, the indigenous culture and community um, that the children are uh, exposed to. So showing uh, this table, that basically presents all the different results and I'll sort of go through it uh, step by step. So first the regression results. So I've um, put a line around the uh, two rows that uh, are most important here. Um, so the first row, the top row, um, is the regression where we have no other control variables. You can see that the impacts or the coefficients that are estimated for ever being, uh, ever using child formal care uh, are fairly large and all significant. The bottom uh, row, which has the red line around it, um, estimates the coefficient on ever being in formal care while controlling for all the um, characteristics that, that we listed on the previous slide. So when we do that, we see that um, the size of the coefficient decreases uh, substantially and becomes insignificant. When we look at uh, which controls are important in sort of decreasing this coefficient, which, which ones are the most important, um, we see that uh, parent characteristics, family environment, and indigenous culture and community have the biggest impact on um, the coefficient for ever being in formal care, indicating that they exert uh, important influence on children's outcome in their own right. Looking at the results that we get when we use the propensity score matching approach, um, first looking at uh, the impact on children who ever used uh, childcare, ever used formal childcare, um, we see that the impact is small and insignificant for all measures. When we look at the children um, who didn't use childcare and the estimated impact on them, in most cases, uh, it's insignificant and small as well. It's just one exception for the measure that was uh, done in the, in the fourth way. So 
what we concluded from, uh, from, from this work is that economics can really contribute a lot to this area and it can do more than it currently does. So I think it's really important to do an analysis where we use the data uh, as much as is possible, controlling for as much of the information that we have available as we can to really try to understand um, direct impacts of uh, interventions or policies on outcomes that we are interested in. And so although, like everyone else, we, 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 we find that childcare attendance is associated with better cognitive outcomes, this seems entirely driven by self-selection into childcare, um, with perhaps the possible exception of a potential positive effect on, on, on some non-users. Um, but there are limitations to, to our research. And so, although the ELSIC is a really fabulous resource, and um, it's, I think it's better data on indigenous families and children than is available in many other countries, which became evident to us when we were doing a literature review, trying to see what other, um, what, what research was done in other countries on this same topic. Um, despite it sort of being much better than, than, than what's available elsewhere, the sample size is still very small for the purposes uh, of our research. And it may be a reason for insignificant, one of the reasons for insignificance. So although we felt that we contribute um, this our study, um, we think more could be done. Um, so maybe a solution is to use administrative data so that we have information on more children to determine whether or not uh, childcare um, really has no direct impact or whether our uh, insignificant results are really due to uh, having a sample that's too small to, to make uh, firm conclusions. Um, we try to make the best use of the ELSIC data to address self-selection, but there is some important information that we didn't have available. So for example, we don't know um, whether um, families had childcare available in the neighborhood. Um, and if they had childcare available in the neighborhood, we didn't really know much about the staff um, working at the childcare center or the curriculum that the childcare center used um, in their interactions with the children. And we think this is really important to explain better the attendance or non-attendance uh, of childcare by indigenous children. So we, of course, do need to know whether uh, Indigenous families actually have access to formal childcare in their neighborhood um, to determine what the reason is for uh, non-attendance. We are also interested to know whether some centers are better at catering to the needs of Indigenous families than other centers. Um, and if they are, whether we can learn something from this and whether we can apply what we learned elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much to Monica and Guion for sharing your research contributions and for doing a fantastic job of compressing a whole paper into just 15 minutes. That's a, a challenge. So we really appreciate um, your contributions today. Also, thank you to your co-authors as well for investing your time and your commitment to these issues. I'd like to acknowledge I'm joining you today from Bungalung country in southeast Queensland and I acknowledge the Ugamba people as the traditional custodians of these lands. We're now going to invite participants to share your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. I can see we've already got some questions coming in, which is fantastic. I'm going to read them out. While people are typing in their questions, I'll also remind you that these papers are available in the economic record and economic papers. So if you have any technical queries that we don't have time to ask here, you can follow up by having a read of the paper and of course, reaching out uh, to the authors. I'd like to kick off the questions by asking a, uh, a question about cultural sensitivity. And I think, Yon, in your final point there, you did pick up on this. And this is a question for both Monica and Gion. The question of cultural sensitivity is really about the the nature of the services that we're talking about here, the delivery, the design of these services, would they generate a different impact on First Nations people and on First Nations children if they were designed 
and delivered in a more culturally sensitive and culturally meaningful way, in a way that more closely reflects First Nations uh, people's cultures, uh, practices, beliefs and values. Now, that might be something that we don't know enough about yet, but what is your sense from examining the literature and thinking about, you know, where are the opportunities for further improvement? The question really is uh, for Guillon, um, could childcare and early learning be designed and delivered in a more culturally sensitive way? And Monica, could financial products, financial services, financial knowledge and education be delivered in a more culturally sensitive way? So perhaps, Guillon, over to you first to reflect on that. Okay, thanks, Leonor, for the question. I think it's a really important one, and it is exactly what, what uh, I had in mind sort of with those last uh, points on my uh, conclusion slide. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is uh, qualitative research that sort of provides some evidence that this may make a difference, that families um, do find it important to know who the staff are and what the sort of backgrounds of staff are and also what the program is that's provided at the child care center so whether that reflects uh, norms and values that they find important um, in the quantitative data there's yeah i mean there's just no information on that uh, as far as i know i think um, if we could uh, use administrative data and use information from child care centers in particular locations we could potentially um, try to understand at sort of a more general level um, what the importance is of uh, particular uh, characteristics of childcare centers. So if they have a cultural program, um, if they have staff that are uh, very aware of the cultural norms and values of the people that are living in, in their neighborhood, does that make a difference for the proportion of children that actually attends that child care center. Um, and I think understanding that better would be really important because we, I mean, I think there's enough studies that sort of show that, that child care use is less likely uh, for children in indigenous families. Um, but I don't think we at the moment have the tools to really understand why that is. Um, so availability is another one because, yeah, I guess this. Uh, a, a larger likelihood of Indigenous families living in remote areas where there may not be uh, childcare available. But it's important to know exactly where the reasons lie. That's um, right. For low attendance mm -hmm. and, and whether it's something we, we need to do something about and whether we can do something about it. Mm, I guess um, tangential to, to that is to what extent is childcare being delivered by uh, Indigenous people uh, themselves as well, who can perhaps impart um, a, a deeper layer of that connection and cultural sensitivity as well. Um, thank you for your reflections on that, Gion. Manika, have you had time to have a think about in the world of financial products and financial services, to what it, what's your understanding of the extent to which they are, um, are tailored or, or reflective of uh, the needs um, and values of Indigenous people? Um, thanks, Lenora. So I think actually uh, you raised a very important aspect of uh, most of these uh, government policies and interventions and um, other um, uh, NGOs, um, all they are doing towards this financial resilience and financial literacy related aspects. Um, so cultural sensitivity is indeed very much important uh, to um, sort of uh, give uh, the full benefits or full effects of those initiatives. And there's not much uh, research done in this area, but there's a, um, not even um, quant or qualitative uh, uh, research, but there's a lot of uh, reports, uh, written uh, government policy reports and some um, uh, banks reports written uh, around this air, uh, aspect. And uh, it actually uh, highlights quite a lot that uh, although there have been several efforts uh, taken by various institutions to improve the financial literacy, uh, financial inclusion, financial capabilities, all this, uh, lack of cultural sensitivity has been uh, play, playing a very uh, critical role in uh, achieving the full uh, maximum outcomes of the, those um, initiatives. So I think 
that's really important aspect that we moving forward we need to think about mm, thank you monica I, there's an overlap or parallel uh, story there when we think about intersectionality in our analysis more widely and we think about other disadvantaged groups such as uh, migrants or, or people from refugee backgrounds how they bring a different sense of, of cultural norms which can affect their interaction with the financial system and, and financial products as well so yeah thank you for sharing um, your knowledge on on that and for encouraging uh, more economists and more research to pursue that issue We've got some great questions coming in. I'd like to share one with you that's coming from Gaz Tamor. Um, thank you, Gaz, for your question. This is, this is directed to you, Monica, and thank you for your interesting presentation. I guess it follows on nicely from what we've just described. The role of spirituality is very important for Indigenous Australians and also plays a vital role in subjective well-being and life satisfaction. Did you measure religiousness of spirituality and he's made reference to some um, acronyms there that might refer to some standardized measures um, the bmmrs um, and all the satisfaction with life scale in your study thanks lena and thanks guys uh, actually uh, we did not look into uh, the the most of the aspects that may have a significant impact on life satisfaction of indigenous australians because we were actually focusing on that financial resilience aspect and financial resilience uh, the variables in the financial resilience framework but indeed there are so many other important aspects that uh, we need to look at when it comes to the well-being and also uh, this information are actually available in the Nazis uh, data set so I think in the future uh, those are the aspects that we are actually looking uh, to uh, investigate yeah thanks Right. Yeah. Always potential to do more. <laughs> this is one of many, many studies. And, and I think collectively, you can see from the nature of the questions coming in, we do have a strong community of researchers and, and policy practitioners and economists in Australia. So it is about sharing that knowledge and learning from each other. A uh, question from Shan Turnbull about uh, the MyGov account. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually in that survey data. Um, this, is, uh, this came up during your presentation, Monica. So um, it's in relation to uh, financial financial products and, and, finance, and, and financial management. Do you have any insights about um, Indigenous Australians and, and their, their use or their interaction with, with MyGov accounts? There is certainly data on um, government support and government services, but uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm actually, uh, I don't have much idea about whether, uh, how many or the proportion of uh, respondents had access to MyGov data. Um, yeah, thanks. That might be, yeah, something to, to look <laughs> at in the future. Thank you, Shan, for that question. A question also came through from Mary Clark. Oops, it's just... These questions jump around when someone upvotes it, they move position. Um, so Mary um, sent this question in during your um, presentation, Monica. Is there a comparable study for non-Indigenous people? And if so, are there notable differences? So I guess the curiosity there is, do, the, do these types of relationships bear out in, in the non-Indigenous population as well? I think uh, Hilda data is the sort of uh, data set that comes into my mind, which has the sort of same data in the um, uh, the financial resilience framework. And the reason we did not go for Hilda data set is that the indigenous component, indigenous respondents is quite minimal in Hilda data set, around 500, uh, um, 500 odd sample size. So that's why we actually would have been really good if it was a comparative study, but um, uh, in yeah the due to lack of data we couldn't do that but in the future uh, we are thinking of doing some comparative studies uh, although they are different data sets thanks monica yeah that brings us neatly to the next question about data and gion you commented i had a question ready about you know what are the limitations of the data and 
what would you like to see if you could um, contribute some input into how data can be better collected. Um, and, and Stephanie Schurer, who is uh, one of the, the leading uh, researchers on uh, Indigenous wellbeing and especially in relation to children and human capital. Um, thanks, Stephanie, for your questions and for your comments and, and our participants can follow through on some of the links to your work as well with the Menzies Centre. Uh, so Stephanie's raised the point about using administrative data um, and the way that she's used that. I guess that takes us to to, um, a, a bigger question, Guillaume, about you know what what would you like to see um, happen in terms of pushing forward progress and um, improving the way that data is uh, collected, the way it's um, made accessible, and potentially also to what extent do we need to incorporate um, the the voices and input of Indigenous people and Indigenous communities more themselves uh, in, in that data collection process? Is that something? something that perhaps you've had some thoughts about um, in the course of, of using this data to answer these big questions? Uh, yes, yes, uh, I have. So we, we actually did try to collect some additional information for the ELSIC uh, data. Um, so we um, did ask about the possibility of uh, linking information on childcare that was locally available um, for the families that were observed in the ELSIC mm -hmm. um, but of course it's not something we could do ourselves because the data had was confidentialized so we didn't know where the communities were um, so we didn't have information on the location of the families ourselves so this was something that would need to sort of be done um, I guess by the um, people at the Department of Social Services that are looking after ELSIC um, and of course, resources are always strained um, and um, it, it would take uh, potentially a little bit of time to actually make that, like make the link um, between sort of the ELSIC and some information on child care centers. So I know mm -hmm. that there is information, there's data uh, available on child care centers and um, the, some of the characteristics of these child care centers. And if that could sort of be brought into the LSIC, that would be really fabulous, I think. I think that would really yeah. help to sort of know what's available to families. And mm -hmm. so you can then get a better sense of how they're making choices. So what are the restrictions to the families that are making the choices? Um, and I think in terms of sort of um, going completely administrative, um, I think that the... Um, but I always forget what it stands for, but the AEDC, which sort of looks at children's, um, I guess, um, performance in a way. I mean, is that the education different. development? Is that the one? Yes, okay. that's the one. They mm. have uh, Australian Education Development Index. Um, but there's, mm -hmm. yes, something else, um, part of the acronym as well. Um, but basically, it, it measures the children's school readiness when they enter school. Um, and so if you could have access to data like that and connect that to children's uh, participation in early child care or in uh, preschool, um, that would sort of be really uh, helpful because that might give you perhaps less detail than the ELSIC data provides, but you would have information on a much broader a group of children mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be really valuable to try and understand what the current state of uh, matters is so uh, first of all how many children do you use child care and what do and if it's less than what we think is desirable why is it and are those things sort of uh, can we remediate those those mm. barriers um, and what would be sort of uh, key uh, ways to do that? So can we identify particular hurdles um, that families face in uh, using uh, childcare? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that they don't want to, and of course that's, that, that's totally fine as long as we know that there, has, there is a clear choice and, 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 and that the choices are sort of good choices for the families. Um, that's right. Mm. That, that, yeah, I think one of the most valuable things you've done there is you've identified potential <laughs> for these linkages between admin and, and other data sets. And even if um, logistically and bureaucratically we can't quite <laughs> assemble those data linkages, um, you have identified that potential and that's something um, for us to collectively uh, work towards and it is about articulating the question and identifying the exact mechanism and the lever where intervention would be most beneficial. So yeah, I think
Thank you, giving us a lot of food for thought there, Kion. Thank you very much. Uh, we're about to move on to the next part of the program now. So um, my thanks again to Gion and Monica. And um, we're Leonora, now going to... Uh, sorry, Leonora, there's one question from the audience uh, in the in the face-to-face -face session. Can oh, I, I forgot. Yeah. We have got <laughs> of course, of course, my apologies. This is what happens when you're, or you're, you're um, you know, deep yeah. in Zoom land. You forget yeah. they're real people. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Um, my name's Joanne Forrest. I actually work for Bachelor Institute. I'm very sorry I'm still away in this group, but it has been um, amazing presentations. So thank you both. Um, what I was wondering, um, I guess, uh, was, you know, with policy and, and you've identified the data linkages, which would, which would definitely um, map a lot better and, and is a good goal. But in the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education Policy of 1989, it's actually still current. And there's some very clear guidelines from early childhood to higher education. Um, so I guess I was wondering whether that is something that could be revisited and mapped to along with the, um, the UNDRIP um, policy, uh, for example, just for an example, um, for early childhood, one is to establish effective arrangements for the participation of Aboriginal parents and community members in decisions regarding planning, de delivery, and evaluation of preschool. Blah blah blah. So, in in every section, I, I was just wondering. Sorry, um, love to hear yeah. some info. Thank you. I think it would be great to actually look at that and to see to what extent that's actually um, brought in practice. Um, so I think from some of the anecdotal evidence, um, it appears that um, in, in, in some instances, um, people don't feel um, sort of that connection, I guess, to the child care center or that they have an influence on what's, what's done there. So they, they don't sort of have that trust uh, sort of relationship I guess that that you would want um, between a parent and a child care centre that um, it would be the best thing for their child to sort of um, spend a few hours uh, every week in the child care centre. And I think, I mean, I, I, I'm not an education specialist, so I'm, I'm not uh, on top of the 1989 um, uh, document, but I think uh, yeah, I think what's, what's really important is, is what's happened, what, what happens in practice. And I think from some of the quantitative, as from some of the qualitative um, evidence, it seems that um, people are not sort of feeling that that's sort of put in place um, appropriately in, in, in all the sort of uh, different um, childcare centers. Thank you, Guion. We'll have to turn to, and I'm sorry we can't address all these questions, and thank you for um, those contributions um, from the group in, in uh, Northern Territory. Um, we'll turn to uh, Renee's presentation now, but we'll also have another Q&A session after Renee. So if there are some questions that um, you might still like to ask, um, they can be for Renee as well, for Guion and, and Monica um, following Renee's presentation. Um, so thank you, and over to you, Renee. Thank you, Leonora. Um, I'd like to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Um, and congratulations to Women in Economics and the Economic Society in Australia for establishing a presence in the Northern Territory. So just get the presentation up. Um, as um, in Mary's introduction, my name is Renee Long. Uh, I'm a Walpuri Warramunga woman from the Barclay region of the Northern Territory. I'm currently working at Charles Darwin University uh, on Larrakia country. I'd like to pay my respects to the Larrakia people and their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the respective lands that all the attendees are participating from today. 
Um, today's presentation is based on Reconciliation in Australia's theme for 2021, More Than a Word, which highlights the need to convert awareness into action. For reconciliation to be effective, it must involve truth-telling and actively address issues of inequality, systemic racism and instances where rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are ignored, denied or reduced. I'll begin talking a bit about colonisation and the impact this has had on the health of Aboriginal people, because if we're going to talk about truth telling, this is really where we need to begin with the acknowledging Australia's history. I would like to do an overview of the federal government's Indigenous procurement policy and how the ripple effects of these types of policies can contribute to improving health and wellbeing of Aboriginal people. Australia has an unpalatable past and it is often ignored as an underlying factor in Aboriginal people's health. Understanding that the definition of health is important because for Aboriginal people, it is more than simply the ab absence of illness. Good health and wellbeing for Aboriginal people includes the health and wellbeing of culture, country, community and spirit. Historical and contemporary policies and practices affecting Aboriginal people as a result of British colonisation have also affected the health outcomes of Aboriginal people. Colonisation began in 1788 and continued as a staggered assault throughout the continent for over a period of 100 years, beginning on the southeast coast and ending in the Northern Territory. The burden of disease, poor socioeconomic status and severe disadvantage of Aboriginal people is a testament to a history of colonisation and its continuation. The practice of colonisation targeted Aboriginal people in a deliberate and calculated manner with the intent to displace, distance people from their land and resources. To achieve this, Aboriginal culture had to be destroyed, firstly through hostilities and more recently through assimilation or mainstreaming. Other government policies such as forced removal of Aboriginal children, government regulation and management of income, displacement and forced disconnection from Aboriginal identity, traditional lands and culture have all led to intergenerational trauma and deficit in Aboriginal health. The Australian Government recognised the deficit in Aboriginal health and developed the National Partnership on Closing the Gap Indigenous Health Outcomes. This provides the framework by which to achieve equality for Aboriginal people in many areas such as health, housing, early childhood development, education, economic participation and regional and remote service to thereby reduce the health inequalities and social injustices experienced by Aboriginal people. To address these in inequalities, the recent objective of closing the gap is aimed to address socioeconomic disadvantage and the life expectancy of Aboriginal people through two broad strategies. One of them is providing equitable policies and two is providing equitable primary health systems. One of these equitable policies in the federal government is the federal government's Indigenous procurement policy. This policy is also known as the IPP and commenced in July 2015. The policy is intended to increase government purchasing from Aboriginal enterprises, which will stimulate economic development and strengthen at the Aboriginal business sector. The policy also is also intended to increase Aboriginal employment, as research shows that Aboriginal enterprises are 30 times more likely to employ Aboriginal people. The policy is not funded, but it leverages off the Commonwealth Government's buying power to increase the amount of business purchased from Aboriginal enterprise. And it uh, just should also mention that this policy only applies to domestic contracts. The primary purpose of the IPP is to stimulate Aboriginal entrepreneurship, business and economic development, providing Aboriginal Australians with more opportunities to participate in the economy. The policy aims to increase Aboriginal procurement in three ways. One is through annual targets for the volume and value of contracts to be awarded to Aboriginal enterprises by the Commonwealth through each portfolio. Two, a mandatory set aside to provide Aboriginal enterprises the opportunity to demonstrate value for money before a general approach to market. This applies to all procurements to be delivered in remote Australia and for all other procurements wholly delivered in Australia with an estimated value of 80 to 200,000. And the third, Aboriginal participation targets to be mandated in high value contracts wholly delivered in Australia valued at 7.5 million or more in a specified industry. No, these are known as mandatory minimum requirements. The success of the IPP is assessed using two key performance indicators. One is the extent to which there is an increase in the number of Aboriginal enterprises contracted to the Commonwealth. And two, the extent to which there is an increase in the volume and the value of contracts awarded to Aboriginal enterprises. Since the policy was first introduced in 2015-16 uh, financial year, a number of Aboriginal businesses were awarded government contracts has seen the original target of 0.5% achieved and exceeded. 
The immediate success of the policy has led to the discarding of annual invoices and government now set the target at 3% for all domestic contracts for future years. Since the IPP launched in 2015, Aboriginal businesses have won contracts valued at over $3 billion. We have a bit of a snapshot, which is, uh, demonstrates from since it was implemented to 20th of July 2020 last year. And it shows um, what would be useful. What would be useful is information about business sizes and business histories, because what the snapshot slide shows is that there are more than 20,000 contracts awarded to less than 2,000 businesses. So somewhere along the line, there are many businesses that are repeat, receiving repeat business. And what would be useful to know is where are these businesses? What is the geographical distribution and which industries are they in? More information in this space will actually tell more of a story about the success of this policy. The, the output slides also show that the number of Commonwealth contracts going to, there are a number of contracts going to Aboriginal businesses. And with this steady flow of business, we can assume that existing Aboriginal owned businesses have been able to increase their capability and their capacity. The Australian Bureau of Statistics reported that the number of Aboriginal Australians going into business is rapidly growing, with a 30% jump in the number of Aboriginal Australians reporting that they were in business in 2016 compared to 2011. And this is a 1% increase in non-Indigenous Australians compared to a 1% increase in non-Indigenous Australians. It would be useful to know the nature of these businesses and are they new majority Aboriginal owned companies or are they partnerships or joint ventures? This policy has certainly created opportunity for these things and even the more opportunistic and not so meaningful black clad entities to emerge. Which leads to the question, how are Aboriginal businesses defined? What can government and other procurers do to ensure they're engaging with the genuine Aboriginal owned company? And with this increase in Aboriginal owned businesses, can it be assumed that this contributes to increasing Aboriginal employment? It has been stated that Aboriginal enterprises are at least 30 times more likely to employ Aboriginal people. What would be useful here is to understand the training programs or employment pathways or professional development opportunities that were or are available through the awarded contracts. Supply Nation is a stakeholder that strongly advocates for federal government Aboriginal business procurement policies. It was previously known as the Australian Indigenous Minority Supply Council. They are a supplier company that enables corporate companies and government to connect with Aboriginal businesses in Australia. In the Northern Territory, the Northern Territory Indigenous Business Network is the peak body representing Aboriginal businesses. It was created with the purpose of establishing, nurturing and growing an interconnected network of Aboriginal owned businesses throughout the Territory. Each state has a state-based peak body representing the businesses. These entities are the certifying bodies for Aboriginal business, and each of them have a directory of businesses for sourcing Aboriginal owned companies. And whilst this policy has great potential, there are some issues that affect implementation and may detract from the intended outcomes. Confirmation of Aboriginality is required to, deter de sorry, to determine ownership. The documentation must be in a form that is from a recognised Aboriginal organisation or another organisation that is deemed appropriate to a certifying body and credibility to attest to the veracity of an individual's claim. Supply Nation accepts statutory declarations, whereas NTRBN do not accept them. The IPP defines an Aboriginal business as, as any business that is 50% or more Aboriginal owned. The NTIBN's definition of Aboriginal business is that it must be a minimum of 51% Aboriginal owned and controlled. This is consistent with Supply Nation certification requirements. And this can present challenges for joint ventures. Supply Nation's definition of a joint venture is that it must be 50% 50, 50 owned, 50-50. For businesses to be certified as Aboriginal owned, here we are. Um, for businesses to be certified as Aboriginal owned, they meet, must meet the above criteria in accordance with the policies of the certifying body. To ensure the Aboriginal ownership does control the company or the business, the certifying bodies conduct interviews to validate ownership. I'm not entirely sure if there is one agreed definition of local employment, and quite often it is dependent on the principle and the content of the contract. But local can be local to a community, local to a region, or local to a state. Each of these depends on the assessor and the intent of the contract. And what about businesses that employ a high number of Aboriginal people? Should they score a little higher in the procurement process, particularly if the Aboriginal employment is a key output of the contract? And while there are likely a few adverse consequences of the IPP, one I would like to draw your attention to is one of those instances where Aboriginal people have spent years or even decades building a business based on quality and reputation 
that are suddenly not winning contracts because they're not certified as Aboriginal owned. Are these businesses now considered at a disadvantage? The easy solution if they're genuinely Aboriginal owned companies would be to become certified. However, in some instances, this is challenging for the business owner. There is occasionally an ideological blockage where they consider that winning contracts under the IPP is a handout. In summary, you can see that there are a lot, there's a lot to consider when looking at an Aboriginal preferential procurement policy. Some of the issues and challenges include the devil being in the detail, definitions need to be clear, and transparent certification processes need to be in place. Inconsistencies in this space leaves rooms for deception and outputs versus outcomes. Does the policy actually reach the intended cohort? More detailed reporting is required for a true understanding of the outcomes. And although not discussed in this presentation, could this policy be interpreted as interfering with markets? It may be needed in thin markets, but what about elsewhere? And are there exit strategies for the policy where there are thin markets? But some of the positives or possibilities include that although there are issues and challenges, this, the Indigenous business sector across Australia has benefited from the IPP and research aside, anecdotally, this is a shared view among Aboriginal business owners. The IPP is possibly increasing Aboriginal employment across many industries throughout Australia, and there is potential to move beyond a 3% target if the government is willing. There is room for detailed reporting to better target those businesses that could benefit the most and to measure the correlation between increased business opportunities and employment. Linking back to Aboriginal health and wellbeing, Aboriginal businesses are a key means of engagement with the dominant economic model. Employment reduces the gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians because employment enables individuals to support themselves, their families and their communities. Importantly, income provides economic independence and development of autonomy. The Social Health Reference Group developed the nine guiding principles that underpin social and emotional wellbeing. While most Australian business owners won't be consciously ticking these off as these guiding principles, they will intuitively understand the principles and will possibly subconsciously structure their businesses and company culture within a manner that aligns with these principles. Aboriginal and owned operated businesses provide avenues for economic participation where ties to land and culture, cultural economic practices are strengthened. Benefits of Aboriginal businesses have been found to substantially outweigh the costs and have a high social return on social investment social return on investment outcomes. Further benefits acknowledged by the social return on investment analysis include strength and pride within families and communities, connection to culture support of dependents in obtaining secretary, secondary and tertiary education, gain finance and management skills, and strengthen community and individual governance and autonomy. And in closing, supporting Aboriginal business through procurement is good business. The social return on investment far outweighs the cost. And to put it plainly, a strong Aboriginal economy can lead to significant social economic impact by mainstream measures, but also for Aboriginal health and wellbeing measures. So mainstream measures may include an increased employment, increased employment rates through real and meaningful jobs reduces the burden on the public purse. Where Aboriginal parents are engaged in full-time employment more means more jobs and more kids go to school where aboriginal people with full-time jobs reduce their interaction with the justice system we know when aboriginal parents are engaged in full-time employment they make future focused financial decisions and we know in aboriginal families where adults are employed they get better health care but some of the aboriginal health and well-being measures are Aboriginal businesses enables Aboriginal people to be employed and maintain the bond between person and land. And this connection constitutes one sense of individual and social identity and responsibility. <coughs> Aboriginal business owners recognise the integrity of relationships between people and spiritual entities and the clarity of connections between people and land. And finally, Aboriginal business owners understand that the social, emotional, spiritual and cultural wellbeing of the whole community is paramount and essential for the health and wellbeing of individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee, for that uh, great insight into um, Indigenous procurement policy. And um, you're welcome to post your questions in the uh, Q&A area. Um, oh, but I would like to indulge in the first question. Um, contracting and procurement in a traditional Western sense can be quite legalistic and, you know, very avoiding mistakes or costs. Um, how can we adopt, how can governments adopt a more relational approach to procurement and contracting that's a bit more 
collaborative and trusting? And what can we learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives on doing business like that? I think some of that work is already beginning through the peak body, such as um, Supply Nation and here in the Northern Territory, the Northern Territory Indigenous Business Network. And in the other states, I think Victoria has Kinaway, New South Wales Indigenous um, Chamber of Commerce. And there are a couple of others in Queensland, um, South Australia and in WA. So having those peak bodies enables government to go to those peak bodies and have discussions about how can we better engage with Aboriginal businesses. But it also gives the Aboriginal businesses um, an avenue to express concern and, and um, those organisations advocate on behalf of the Aboriginal businesses to, to try and work with uh, in the procurement space in a little, little bit better in a manner that's um, more appropriate to getting positive outcomes. We, we quite often hold briefing sessions for the members that we have here in the Northern Territory, and we can ask um, the government officials and policy developers and the procurement officers to come along to those sessions and have conversations. Um, we quite often run um, the tender writing uh, workshops, and in that we have government representatives come along and talk about the weightings and how they assess the tenders so that people are better informed about how to complete their tenders. And I guess uh, that sort of partly answers Mary Clark's question about what sort of training can be provided to support Aboriginal businesses take sort of best advantage of procurement opportunities from government and private business. And do you see private business doing this as well? Yeah, and I think um, one of the things we always encourage the members to do here is to always go along to a briefing. If you don't win the contract, go along to a briefing and, and take the feedback on board and how to um, respond to future tenders. And But also, even where you have won a tender, we encourage people to get a bit of feedback to find out where, where their strengths were in the tender process and where they could improve for future. And a, a question from Simon Bennett, I guess, on you know, modelling business success or demonstration effects. Do you find that happens in Aboriginal communities so where there is a successful example of an Aboriginal enterprise that people pick up some of those uh, practices? Yeah, to a degree. I think there is some of that um, sharing of business, business acumen and business modelling. But each location is a little different based on... Um, the diversity of the region and the, and the groups. So how things might be done here in the top end are probably different to how they might be done in Central Australia. And it does depend on the community group, um, the structure of the business, whether it's family orientated or if it's um, based on a community and several clan groups. So there are a couple of different ways of approaching that. Okay. Um, perhaps we should see if the audience in Darwin has any questions for Renee. Uh, yep, great presentation. Uh, it wouldn't be CDU if we didn't have uh, technical difficulties. So <laughs> apologise for that, but you did a fantastic job, and I think you, you probably did better than most lecturers would, uh, would would do in that situation. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, really interesting presentation. And um, sort of mo moving forward, wh wh where do you think? Um, we could be doing more work and research in this field. What, what would be most productive? I think, think really the, ne the next step that I personally would like to see, I, I'm an active NTRBN board member and we engage quite a bit with the Northern Territory Government in developing their Aboriginal contracting framework, which I think will be now called Aboriginal Procurement Policy. So we've been doing quite a bit of work with them to get consistent definitions and talking about um, certifying of Aboriginal businesses. So that... That is very positive for us. But I think for us to understand how policies like the IPP and an Aboriginal procurement policy, to, to get a good measure of whether how successful they actually are, we need to understand if we are hitting the intended cohort, are we going to the smaller businesses and helping them to grow? Or is it just being accessed by the bigger businesses that are already competitive and compete in an open market anyway? So a bit more information in the reporting side of things to help us be, to be able to assess that would be good. And also finding out if there is a direct correlation to employment outcomes for those businesses that are winning tenders. It is, um, and that's on a you know, national scale through the IPP and here locally, because um, to be honest, the Aboriginal workforce, there's only a limited number of skilled Aboriginal labour 
in the workforce. So what tends to happen now is that people are poaching other people's workers. Someone went to big contract mm. and they go and pinch everybody's workers <laughs> because they want the skilled workforce immediately. But what we actually need to see is more people being trained. But for that to happen, government needs to put in a pipeline of work. So there is four to five years of work for people to put on apprentices and to, to um, train the more job ready people that are in our community. But not on a related but slightly different tack. I mean, what, what more can CDU do in that space, do you think? I think um, hmm, that's an interesting point. But if we could do more research into the space and then um, encourage those that do collect the data to make that more publicly available, or even to provide information about what what data would be useful to collect through the procurement process so that we can do the analysis would be useful. Because some people don't don't measure. They're just um, tick boxes. Yes, this has been done. This is great. But if we actually build um, build the information, we'll have a lot more data to to research. Okay. Sure. And to Thank you. And one final question from Abdallah Al Mamun. I guess if Commonwealth government has sort of changed its procurement policy, do they even go beyond and reshape national budget policy to better support? Indigenous economic participation and well-being and reconciliation. <laughs> They're, um, they've they've done some some shaping, but I think um, where where the target was met in the first year of hitting three percent um, spend, I think some work in that space would be great. They should be courageous and consider a 0.5 or one percent increase annually until we hit a ten percent spend or something like that. Um, but uh, that's something that federal government should consider. And perhaps if we do more research here at CDU, we'll be able to influence some of that. Great. Now, there are more questions in the chat, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So hopefully um, some of you can get in touch after this and share your insights and questions. So Renee, thank you so much for a great presentation. And I will now pass on to Leonora Rees, who will close the event. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everyone. It's my job here. I've got the honour to wrap up the event. Um, it's been an amazing collation of wisdom and knowledge and research insights and practical strategies. So thank you very much to all of our presenters, Renee, Monica and Guion, and also to Mary for co-hosting. Um, it's been incredibly valuable to learn from the experiences of Renee, and we greatly appreciate your perspective from the point of view of Aboriginal businesses and how it links to Aboriginal wellbeing. Thank you to Charles Darwin University, including Professor Pascal Tremblay for your support. Thank you to the affiliated groups that have supported this event, including the LCC, the Life Course Centre. And thank you to Di Litherland from the ESA for your technical assistance behind the scenes. And these events wouldn't be as in, um, impactful if we didn't have attendees. So thank you to everyone for tuning in, for submitting your questions and for contributing um, your interest and support. As Mary has said, it's unfortunate that we are up against the clock and we can't answer all these questions, but we intend for this to be the first of many events focusing on uh, Indigenous wellbeing. And so we will take your questions and use them to shape um, further topics. In summary, this event has had two purposes. The first has been to elevate the importance of Indigenous wellbeing and reconciliation as an issue of priority for us in Australia, as economists, as policy analysts, as policy makers, as researchers, public servants, and as members of a community. And we do this by sharing knowledge, by listening deeply, to Australia's First Nations people, to learn and understand more about the values, cultures, experiences, biases and barriers that they encounter in existing systems of society, as well as to learn from their wisdom, their strength and their knowledge that they can impart and we can all learn from. And this all contributes to more clearly identifying what policies work, what doesn't, where can we pursue further research and practical partnerships between policy researchers, uh, universities, businesses and communities. And it was great to hear those questions coming through from the participants. 
We also acknowledge there are many organisations, community groups and practitioners who have long been striving towards improving the outcomes and opportunities of First Nations people. One of these is the organisation Reconciliation Australia, and that's where we've drawn the theme of this event from, more than a word, more than a word which highlights the need to convert talk into action. If you haven't read it yet, you'll see that the Reconciliation Australia report has identified five dimensions of reconciliation, historical acceptance, race relations, equality and equity, institutional integrity and unity. Our presentations today they have touched on some of these dimensions, particularly the pursuit of equality and equity. But we all clearly must do more to push forward with progress on all of these dimensions. Economics has a role to play in collaboration with other disciplines, with businesses, governments, educators and communities. This is all about the spirit of inclusion and learning from others. The second main goal today of today's event was to reach out and to connect with the economics community up there in the top end of the Northern Territory. There is currently no ESA branch in the Northern Territory. We understand it's a very small community in terms of population, but it is part of Australia. So if we are aspiring to build a truly national professional organization of economists, we can't leave out any part of the map. We especially want to reach out to women economists in the Northern Territory. We know that women are already underrepresented in the economics profession and networks and connections are very important, especially in remote locations. And we aspire for you to feel a sense of belonging to the economics profession through WEN. So final message, if you would like to join the ESA and when, we invite you to join one of the existing state and territory branches. This will give you access to the benefits of ESA and when membership, including some members only events and resources. For when this includes our professional development workshops, a mentoring retreat and access to our media and speaker register. Creating a branch requires people and effort and enthusiasm. And as Monica has mentioned, please get in touch if you're in the Northern Territory and you'd like to be part of this. Please just contact the ESA email address. And the Northern Territory participants, now at the end of this uh, webinar, you're going to enjoy uh, a lunch up there in Darwin in person. And we warmly invite you to stay around and talk more about this potential. As I mentioned earlier, we aspire for this to be the first of an ongoing stream of events focusing on Indigenous wellbeing hosted by the ESA and WEN. So researchers, please connect with us and so we can plan future ways to share your knowledge and insights. And we mustn't lose sight of the fact that we're aiming to translate this knowledge into constructive and meaningful change for our Indigenous people. Thank you, everyone, and we hope that you have found this informative and inspiring. Please stay connected. Thank you.